So welcome everybody and thank you for joining our Women for Solutions webinar. We are proud to share a 174th webinar where we create awareness, connect, learn, inspire, action and reimagine and regenerate our world towards a more caring economy. I'm Laura Jadaru Koch, founder of Women for Solution, a global network of thousands of women and, and men, entrepreneur and entrepreneur in over 40 countries that share simple, effective and scalable solutions towards a caring economy. A, stim a system that values the key importance in wellness in people and nature. Today, it's our seventh webinar of a series of the legacy of Mary Magdalene. As many of you know, uh, all this last year, we have done these webinars, uh, mostly uh, where um, uh, Teresa Gagna, who's here on the line also, has talked about the incredible discoveries in the last 60 years in Egypt, in Turkey, in Greece, of authentic text around the first and second century AC by the uh, by the Knoxtis, by 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 amazing um, scholars in many many universities, uh, but today we're gonna do it a little bit different because our focus is on art, the beauty of art and Mary Magdalene during the Renaissance and Baroque period, and how her impact and legacy actually was portrayed in art because it was forbidden in other ways. So our main speaker today, or our scholar, is this amazing woman, Dr. Evelyn Bassegno, a fellow Italian uh, that has a PhD in Italian Renaissance and Baroque art and at the Rutgers University. She's a renowned lecturer and re uh, researcher on Baroque and Renaissance art and will be addressing today her passion about women and art and the role they have played in history uh, and how they have actually been the very powerful in their time, but they couldn't be written in history. Dr. Baseggio, uh, mm -hmm. uh, or Evelyn, yeah. the friends, <laughs> uh, has uh, worked extensively in various museums, Morgan Library, uh, the, um, uh, Mom, the, the Freak Museum, Metropolitan, and is currently writing a book entitled The Pilgrim of, Pilgrimage of Venice that also focuses on uh, women and uh, in Venice in that period as the new Jerusalem. She will tell you more about it. But before we start, I would like to ask you, Evelyn, as we talked, if you can, before we start with a presentation and your description, 
if you can share your passion about where did it start, how did it start this uh, this uh, this the seeking of the truth or the authenticity about Mary Magdalene through art, and what has she uh, what was has been her legacy, and what are your thoughts and personal opinion of all your research of many many a few decades, just to say it simply. Thank you, uh, Evelyn. Thank you, Laura, for the introduction. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very excited to be part of this um, group of lectures. And I listened to Tara lecture, Tara lectures before. Um, so why I was um, I got interested in Mary Magdalene, but it's easy because um, I'm a passionate uh, admirer of um, Caravaggio. And I think that Caravaggio is one of those artists that really uh, capture uh, the human side of this woman and tries to make us relate to her. Even if it doesn't in a wrong way, as I will try to explain to you. Mary Magdalene is an important figure to me because um, her story is a story of many women, many women that have been silenced through history. Many women whose image has been manipulated and change because uh, everything was controlled by a male power and a male gaze. So that's why it's important to um, shed light on these figures and talk about their historical role and try to understand um, what is really their legacy and what they can teach us today about how we can better our life as women. Because we're still facing those kind of issues. We're still being silenced sometimes and being put in uh, lower roles in society and we need to build our own identity, but we need to not be afraid of what happened before, but know it and face it in the proper way. So that's how I think it's important. That's why I think it's important to talk about women in art. And also one thing that I noticed while I was studying uh, throughout the years is that even if women were silenced in writings and there were not many women artists or women writers or they were not well connected in this because there were some of them and my next actually field of research will be trying to figure it out what kind of writers were very popular in Venice in the Renaissance and why those writers have been forgotten through the centuries because they brought something very interesting but what I realized is that women were still very visible women were very, very much represented and repeatedly. And so that's what uh, interests me. So they could not get rid of us and our importance and beauty. And so uh, we were there just in the background for a few centuries, unfortunately. Should we start, Laura? Yes, please, you can start sharing your screen and, and showing your marvelous pieces that you've chosen to portray uh, her story and her impact, her legacy, and, and uh, how different people had uh, portrayed her <laughs> in their imagination. Yes, well, let's see. So my lecture today, a little brief introduction. <clears throat> so thinking about people, women, that have been manipulated throughout the century by male scholars, um, writers, and theologians. I think Mary Magdalene is the one that was most sacrificed in a sense. So what I want, what I aim to do today, it's doing a little bit of the history of the literature that we have on earth, um, coming from the gospels or early Christian writings and accompany that with images. Because what I want to show to you is that how much a historical figure has faded and has been changed um, in such a way that we can even recognize her anymore as the apostle of Jesus, because that's who she was. Mary Magdalene was not the repentant prostitute that everybody remembers. She was the apostle of Jesus, one of the most important ones. I will start with this image. Let's see if it works. <laughs> I'm pressing, it's not moving. Sorry, a second. Okay. Every time I think about Mary Magdalene, and I think this also happens to you, this is the kind of image that comes to my mind. Mary Magdalene is often represented as this young, beautiful, 
lavishly dressed woman with this very distinguished reddish blonde long hair and holding uh, this ointment jar in her hands, which is her attribute. And uh, this image in particular caught my attention because uh, if it wasn't for the jar, I wouldn't even think that this is Mary Magdalene. She's such like a, a seductive figure. Look at the way that she's looking at us. She's definitely not a saint. And there's two hints that tells us something about her and her future as a saint in this painting. On the right side of the painting, do you see, I don't know if you know, that there is a, a tree with a, a dead trunk. And then there is another branch that is coming out full with new foliage. That represents her being sinful, but then becoming a repentant once she embraced Jesus' truth. And that's actually a kind of metaphor that it's often uh, remembered in the Gospels of Jesus as well. And then in the far distance on the left, I don't know if you notice, but there is a little representation of a woman being carried by angels. And that's actually the end of the story of Mary Magdalene that we'll be talking about later. So the... Um, I would like to start by talking a little bit about the historical now, uh, Mary Magdalene, accompany them with images, as I said to you before. So the earliest Christian literature, including the gospel that came to be part of the New Testament, portrays Maria of Magdala as a prominent Jewish disciple of Jesus. Her epithet probably indicates the town where she was coming from. This town of Magdala was located on the west shore of the Sea of Galilee. In the gospel, her name appears very often, first, usually as the first one mentioned among the women who followed Jesus. And I have here some abstracts from readings from the gospels, from the canonic ones. Mark says, for example, there were also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, the younger, and Joseph, and Salome. These used to follow him and provided for him when he was in Galilee. And there were many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem. Luke gives some further specification about these women, adding, Soon after, he went on through the cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him, and also some women, who had been ill of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Cusa, Herod's household manager, and Susanna, and many others, who provided for them out of their means." This last detail, there are some passages that I underline because they're very important for you to pay attention to. The last detail about women provided for Jesus is quite interesting and attests for the important role played by these women, Magdalene first, in supporting Jesus' ministry as patrons. So these women were not just like poor women following Jesus. They were providing with their own means. So they were establishing the society and they chose to support Jesus with their own money. Now, when I was uh, looking for this quote uh, through the Bible, I wanted to find an image to represent these women. And you will not believe me, I could not find an image representing women as the apostles of Jesus. There's no, no image of that. Usually when Jesus represented preaching is always surrounded by men, by the male apostles. So I found only this little image that comes from actually from a larger um um, uh, other piece that represent the story of Mary, the Virgin Mary, the mother of Jesus. And as you can see, uh, Jesus is parting from the mother and say goodbye to her. And this is actually no even part of the gospel. The scene comes from a later book and late medieval book that is called the Meditations on the Life of Christ that gives like more information about um, the contest of the period. And so there you see Jesus, this very intimate moment when he hugs his mother before embracing his future passion and destiny in Jerusalem. And together with him, there are the apostles, but also three women, beautifully dressed, very lavishly dressed, like a patron will look like. And this is the only image I could find. Otherwise, the only instance in which women are represented is only when they have like a 
a very crucial role in some of this in some in events. Apart from being a follower of Jesus, Mary Magdalene is also among the women who in the Gospels saw the resurrected Jesus first. And I want to emphasize that this is important, that all the Gospel mentioned the visit of the women to the sepulcher. So this is a very important uh, event. Since, according to the Jewish custom, actually the women were supposed to anoint the dead body, to prepare for burial. Men were not supposed to do that. <clears throat> And in the case of Jesus, since Jesus died on a Sabbath, they were not, they could not do it on that day. So they put in the sepulcher and then the day after the women approached the sepulcher to prepare the body. The interesting thing is that the gospel, the four gospel um, provide a different account of the story, of course, and the number of women. But what is important for us is that Mary Magdalene appears in each of the four gospels. And she's always had a prominent role, as in the one, for example, of Matthew. Now, after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angels say to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, and he, as he said, come, see the place where he lay, then go quickly and tell his disciple that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to the God, to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. It's in the fourth gospel, though, that really Mary Magdalene stands out in the Gospel of John, the gospel that I prefer actually. Is where Mary Magdalene stands out as um, playing a crucial role in Jesus' passion and resurrection. Uh, as you see in this passage that I'm not going to read to you and in this image that accompanies it, accompanies it um, Jesus is here crucified and the only people who are supporting him are the women and John the Evangelist. But most important for us is what John tells us about uh, Mary Magdalene later on. And at the time of the resurrection, this is a very important passage. But Mary stood weeping outside. So Mary Magdalene arrives to the sepulcher and see the stone. I have to give you a little background. See the stone that had been pushed and then realize the tomb is empty. So she goes and calls Peter and John. Peter and John come. They go inside. They see that it's empty. I think... Uh, um, and then they leave. Um, but she st stays there. Mary Magdalene does not run away like the disciple. And this is what happens. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stopped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They say to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they laid it. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you carry him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabbi, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling on me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciple, I've seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. So why this passage is important? Let's review it together. Well, first of all, in the gospel in general of John, Mary Magdalene plays like this very prominent role. She's very close to Mary, the mother of Jesus, to the aunt of Jesus, that's probably Salome. 
And she's the most important of the disciples. And she has this very close relationship with Peter and John himself. She's with Jesus when he dies. So it's, she's always accompanying him. She's one of the most faithful disciples. And then she's the first to see the empty sepulcher, to see the angel, and to see the resurrected Christ. Not only that, but she received the most important task from Jesus because she's the one who announces resurrection. So the level of authority that Jesus grants her here is highly relevant for our story. The only down part about the story is the noli me tangere, you know, in Latin, don't touch me. Because this is beautifully represented in this painting by um, Titian. Uh, but the interesting part is that I found that early Christian writers, when they were interpreting this passage, they did not um, consider the fact that Jesus told her, don't touch me, as something negative. And actually, Tertullian praised Mary because she approached Jesus to touch him. And I quote, out of love, not from curiosity, nor with Thomas' incredulity. And I end quote, the quote. For him... The issue for Tertullian, the issue is that she could not touch Christ yet because his resurrection was not completed. Until he ascended to the Father, he could not be touched, which is a kind of a, like an interesting, um, an interesting thought. So apart from the canonic Gospels, Mary Magdalene also plays a very important role and is portrayed as a prominent disciple especially in the Apocrypha, where she interacts with Jesus, where she asks him questions. In his statements, in, in his own statements about Mary Magdalene, Jesus makes clear every time that she is to be counted among the disciples who fully comprehend the Lord's teaching. The most interesting testimony in this case from the Apocrypha, in my opinion, comes from the Gospel of Philip in which Mary is again listed among the most prominent of the female followers of Jesus, but singled out in a quite special way. And I have to read it with you. This is a very interesting um, testimony about Mary Magdalene. There were three who traveled with the Lord all the time, his mother Mary, her sister, and Magdalene, who is called his companion, because Mary is his sister, his mother, and his partner. The second passage is a little bit um, philosophical and difficult to understand, but I will explain it to you later. The wisdom who is called the barren is the mother of the angels and the companion of the Savior, Maria the Magdalene. She's the one the Savior loved more than all the disciples and he used to kiss her on the mouth often. The rest of the disciple, they say to him, why do you love her more than all of us? The Savior say to them in reply, one do I, don't I love you like her? When a person is blind and one who sees are both in the dark, they're not different from one another. When the lights come, the one who sees will see the light and the one who's blind will remain in the dark. And I, I pause a second and explain to you something before I read the, the last passage. Um, so if you read these passages, the first thing that comes to mind, and many scholars uh, and many readers of the Bible have been interpreting this in this way, is that there is a special relationship with between um, Jesus and Mary that is almost carnal. But I would like you to read past that. We're not discussing the fact that she could be the wife of Jesus right now. I just want you to understand that most of the scriptures were written with a metaphorical kind of message. But what I want you to emphasize is still that how important she is, you know, um, the kissing, the fact that she's the favorite. Well, I have to explain. Mm. Uh, Mary seems to be understood that the part of the wisdom, Mary seems to be understood as wisdom, uh, wisdom because she is at once the mother of the angels. Jesus' spiritual sister, remember Jesus did not have children, but had siblings, and his female counterpart. And the kissing, it's not something that refers to intimacy in a male-female thing, but it refers here 
to the intimate reception of spiritual teaching. For not only the Lord suggests that the male disciple should seek to be loved by him in the same way, but he also says, and listen to this, and had the word gone out from the heavenly place, it would be nourished from the mouth and it would become perfect. For it's by a kiss that the perfect conceive and give birth. For this reason, we also kiss one another. We receive conception from grace, which is in one another. So this sort of intimacy is because Mary Magdalene is really beloved by Jesus because of her spiritual perfection. So she is one of the most knowledgeable, the most spiritual of the apostles. So given the importance of this woman, from these few passages, I mean, the idea that we have of Mary Magdalene is that she was a very important woman that played an important role in early Christian writings, in the one that the church actually approved also, not only the apocryphal ones. So how is it possible that this woman who played such an important role from a moment to another was turned from the apostle of the apostle into a sinful prostitute? When this change happened at a specific time, happened in the fourth century. Is that the period when the fathers of the church uh, changed tone when addressing Mary Magdalene in their writings? And that's where everything suddenly changed. A new portrayal of this woman was painted in writings and crystallized by a sermon that was pronounced by Pope Gregory the Great at the end of the sixth century. So Gregory the Great, and this is not like something like um, some important discor discoveries pretty much uh, recognized uh, recently. Uh, Gregory the Great basically combined together different women from the gospel and decided they were all Mary Magdalene. So he first in this passage is a long passage from his sermon that maybe later you can read on your own. I will read a little bit with you. So Gregory the Great first read the passage of the gospel from Luke that tells the famous story of the sinful woman, remember, that washed the feet of Jesus. I think all of you are familiar with that in the house of the Pharisee. And I'm showing you an image here uh, by Paolo Veronese. And then he immediately identified this woman with Mary Magdalene. And this is what he says. When I think of Mary, repentance, I feel more like crying the same something. Indeed, what part? even if we're of stone, would not be moved by the example of penance that the tears of the sinner gave us. She considered, she considered what she had done and did not want to limit that she was going to do. Here, she's introduced among the guests. She comes uninvited. And at the feast that she offers her tears, learn what pain this woman is burning. She who does not blush to cry even in the middle of a feast. The one that Luke called a sinner and that John names Mary, we believe that she is the Mary of whom, according to Mark, the Lord had cast out seven demons. And what are the seven demons, if not the universality of all vices? Since seven is a feast to embrace the old time, the number seven rightly represents universality. Mary has seven demons in her, for she was full of all vices. But now... Having seen the stains that dishonor her, she ran to wash herself at the source of mercy without blushing in the presence of the guest. So great was her shame inside that she could not see anything outside to blush. So, I mean, you can immediately sense uh, what is happening here. The process of identification of Mary Magdalene with a series of other women in the gospel that has started. So she's not anymore just the Mary Magdala. She's uh, the woman uh, that washed the feet of Jesus in the house of the Pharisee, and she becomes the sister of Martha and Lazarus, who also, at some point in the gospel, wash or cleans the feet of Jesus with, um, with a very expensive ointment, arising a, a very bad response from part of the, of the apostles, of the main apostle. So from this moment on, from this sermon, her image is blurred forever. And that's how she's always represented from now on. Like a woman at the feet of Jesus. I love this painting in particular. I want to focus for a little bit on this painting. Uh, 
this painting is actually not based on the Gospels because then, you know, even when this new image of the Ver of, of Mary Magdalene was like sort of created, people needed more materials to uh, enrich it. So there is this man, Pietro Retino, was an intellectual who was writing in Venice in the 16th century, a very controversial figure, by the way, who wrote this kind of like uh, modernized version of the Gospels in which he talks about an event that never happens in the Gospels, but just like a had it, his own probably interpretation, that it's kind of interesting because it adds to the story of the sinful prostitute. In this image, you see Martha. Martha is at the center where Mary Magdalene is the one kneeling at the feet of Jesus, of course. Martha takes her sister Mary to the temple to hear Christ to preach as she's worried about her spiritual health. Mary is dressed in a very inappropriate dress, as you can see, with a low cut dress. And that's a sign of her sinful life of vanity and pleasure. But as soon as she meets Jesus, as you can see, she's immediately converted and the chain, the, the golden chain on her neck just opens up and falls. And she becomes immediately a follower of Jesus. But this is just one of the images that were common in the Renaissance. The most, let's say, um, the one that are more uh, familiar to us are two different versions. Mary Magdalene in the Renaissance, she's always represented as the woman at the feet of Jesus in the deposition. Like in, in remembrance of being the one who washed the feet of Jesus with her tears or anointed the feet of Jesus with the expensive oil, she's always at the feet of Jesus. And she's the most beautiful, the young one, the one that it's always like caressing him and being very close to him. But this is the other one that became very popular. And this is also related to another manipulation of the story of Mary Magdalene. And this is uh, the idea of Mary Magdalene as an hermit. This image was basically introduced by a medieval text that you might have learned about before, which I, it's a text that I love to read all the time. It's called The Golden Legend. It was written in the 13th century by the Archbishop of Genoa, and it tells the story of saints. It collects all the information about the saints and sometimes it reaches the story with farther legends and miracles than, that like are supposed to make the points that it wants to make stronger. So in the story of Mary Magdalene, what does Jacopo Zavaragini say? Well, he said basically makes, it's a very long text, so I didn't copy all of it for you, but it starts by saying exactly what Gregory the Great says, that she is a... Uh, she used to be a simple woman, that she's the sinner, and uh, she's the same person as the woman who cleaned the feet of Jesus, and so on. But then he adds on her story by telling of her apostolic mission in Marcel with his brother. Because the legend is that when the apostles scattered to... Um, to disperse the, the, the gospel, the good news everywhere in every part of the world. Even Mary Magdalene went with his brother uh, away uh, from uh, Israel and she ended up in France, in Marcel to be specific. And uh, Jacopus da Baragine goes in detail by telling us the story that she's an amazing speaker and she converted the entire city of Marseille, included the king and the queen. And there's a lot of anecdotes that are kind of like juicy and interesting. And then what happened? When she does that, she left her brother as the bishop. And she retires for 30 years in the desert. So for 30 years, she goes into the desert and she kind of like stays there to mortify her flesh. And I think the most beautiful image, the most um, literal image of this uh, mortifying of the flesh is the sculpture made of wood by uh, Donatello. You see that there's nothing anymore that resembles the beautiful young woman that we've seen before. Her body is emaciated and the long hair has become like this rough, almost like piece of fabric that is covered in her body. She reminds me a lot of images of John the Baptist. So she stays there 
And I I put this passage actually in, interspersed into the story of Mary Magdalene. There's some instances in which Jacob of Zavaragin says something very interesting about her relationship with Jesus. So I have to read it to you. And this is she, the same Mary Magdalene, to whom our law gave so many great gifts and showed so great signs of love that he took from her seven devils. He embraced her all in his love and made her right familiar with him. He would that she should be his hostess and his procuress on his journey and oftentimes excuse her sweetly. So there is this beautiful image of how close is Jesus to her. And then, and then he goes on by telling that while she was living in the desert, Jesus take care of her because she is like in the middle of nowhere with no water, no food or anything. But at every hour and at the same time every day, um, a cluster of angels takes her into heaven and feed her with the beautiful music of heaven. And then eventually, when it's time for her to reconnect with Jesus, she ascends into the heaven. As you can see in this image, she received the last communion and she's uh, finally uh, together with her um, creator. So now there's nothing like more distant from the image that we saw before of Mary Magdalene by Donatello than this one by Titian. I mean, a century later, Titian represent her uh, in this very central version uh, where her beauty is reflected in her long, shiny hair and revealed breast. At first sight, in my opinion, Mary Magdalene looks more like uh, Venus, like the Venus Botticelli, that's why I put the Venus of Botticelli beside her, then uh, the saint, penitent, saint in the desert represented by Donatello. But her gaze is what is guiding us and tell us that she is captured in this spiritual rapture. The eroticism of this image does not contrast, uh, even if it might look to you very strange, does not contrast with uh, the idea of um, Mary Magdalene um, as a saint, okay? Uh, the language of profane love was normally used by female mystics, and we have writings about that, Santa Teresa d'Avila, for example. They, every time they describe their longing, their first their thirst for the love of God, they talk in very sensual terms. They almost compare their desire to unite with God to the desire of a woman for his spouse, for a spouse, sorry. In this love languages and metaphors are have a precedent in the Bible, in the songs of the songs. And this is what happens. I found this very beautiful um, poem so this painting by Titian, you will think is such a voyeurist, the painting probably belonged to a man. Well, in this case, not. This painting probably belonged to Vittoria Colonna. For those of you who know her, Vittoria Colonna was a dear friend of uh, Michelangelo and she was uh, belonging to a circle called the Spirituals. So she was one of those women that before the Counter Reformation thought that there was something wrong about the Catholic Church that needed to change. The, the Catholic Church needed to repent itself and change its course. So she was a very devout woman and she wanted this image. And she wrote a number of poems, sonnets about Mary Magdalene because she was a fantastic poetess and she exchanged poems with, um, with her friend, uh, Michelangelo. And as you can read in this poem, read it with me, um, Jesus is described as a lover, as the divine lover of Mary Magdalene. Blessed lady in whose face shines with the light of eternal love. Holy darts, a rainbow supernatural, a torch of the ashes fire led you to cross the threshold that the bright countryside. Sweet and gentle was the news that took you and the snare to set you free. For you, the mortal way, the sin that bore down on your heart was a blessed burden, epithing, a wound, a scar, Cure your soul, your tears cleanse your scalps, clear your mind, left you sound. Bless ravaging flames that preclude another fire. 
She lay down at his feet. The strong hand drew her up. The true lover who simply accepts her heart welcomes, welcomes her. I mean, this is really one of those images it shows to you how there is a very thin um, boundary between profane and sacred love and how the carnal aspects become so evident um, sometimes in religious writing that it's almost make you blush when you read it because we're like a little bit confused by it. But this makes a lot of sense because now that we're jumping for the end of the lecture, to look at a few images from the Baroque, you will see how is that sensuality that it's used by Baroque artists. Teach an interpretation of Mary Magdalene as a sensual beauty burned by God's love. Work as a sort of bridge, in my opinion, between the image of Mary Magdalene as an elegant aristocrat or an emaciated zealot that we saw before in the Renaissance and the passionate penitent of the Baroque. This is the period where Mary Magdalene becomes truly a model of life. Mary Magdalene became an herald of the mission of the Counter-Reformation, and the mission was that to inflame the viewer's faith through relatable and emotionally engaging models of living. Thus, the image of Mary as a redeemed sinner strongly resonated with an audience which was afflicted by human imperfection, frailty, and mortality, Magdalene is certainly, if you look just Google Magdalene in Baroque art, is certainly one of the most beloved subjects by patrons, artists, uh, um, humble people, wealthy people. Everybody loved this, this kind of subject. And all the Magdalene's you see through Baroque art, they're all beautiful, sensual women, but their beauty is put at the service of God. The penitent Magdalene became a sort of an iconographic specialty for this artist called Guido Reni. There are several versions that he made. He was um, a follower and a pupil of Annibale Caracci. And uh, the reason for the preference for this sort of method, for this sort of like um, um, a representation of Mary Magdalene, uh, it's because the church wanted really her her. Mary Magdalene represented the most important um, sacrament that was discarded by the reformers, which is the uh, penitence, okay? The confession. I mean, Martin Luther wanted to get rid of that because he thought that we don't need anybody to help us repent. We don't need the intercessor of the priest. We don't need any of that. The repent repentance is something you do in communion with God, but no, what the Catholic Church was promoting is exactly the opposite. So that's why she becomes like really uh, so beloved by the Catholic and, Church. And you, can you mention there, this is because they were selling the indulgences at that time, no? Well, the, yes, before this time. <laughs> before this time they were selling and they wanted to promote that, to continue that. To continue that, exactly. If you give me a little money, I will pray a little bit more for you so you get closer to heaven faster, no? That was the promotion <laughs> that the Catholic Church used for many centuries, unfortunately. But fortunately for me, because they created beautiful works of art because of that, fortunately. <laughs> uh, in this version, as you can see, Magdalene really retains the beauty and sensuality that we're seeing in Titian and it's visible in her soft and white skin, the shiny air, the perfect oval of the face, but her redirect gaze toward the angels and toward heaven, and these angels are offering her comfort. This is an hermit. Uh, while she meditates on mortality, she's holding, as you can see, her hand on the skull. Uh, this is what makes this image at the service of God and not just a sensual, beautiful image. This is actually one of the most interesting paintings that I found. I didn't know about this painting before I was preparing for the lecture on Mary Magdalene. And uh, talking about the fact that Mary Magdalene was able to speak to different levels of the society, she was the perfect image to be used to convince women, sinful women, to redeem themselves. And this one was done actually for a church actually for a church attached to a convent that was called the Convent of Mary Magdalene of the Converted. So you can imagine what it was. 
It was a monastery especially built around, I think, Piazza di Spagna in 1520 to um, welcome repentant prostitutes. Prostitution was a big problem in Rome in the 16th century, in the 1600s, sorry, in 17th century. And, um, and these women, most of the time, were doing that because they have no other job to do in life. You know, there was no possibility. Um, people think of Baroque era as this glamorous, uh, beautiful, fancy moment in history. And instead, it was one of the darkest, the most violent centuries that ever existed. And Rome did not look like the Rome today. Rome looked like a horrible, dirty, dangerous place. A little bit, I imagine Rome like New York in 1970s, actually, in the seventh, Rome in the 17th century. And this altarpiece was made by another follower of Annibale Caracci, Guercino, for this main altar of this church that welcomed these prostitutes. And as you can see, this kind of image is like a conflates the two images that we saw before. The one of Mary Magdalene at the sepulchre and the hermit. She's here like not represent as the apostle entering the sepulchre and witnesses the rising Christ, but she's uh, weeping and she's looking intensively at the crown of thorns. And as you can see, she's half undressed, so there's some sort of sensuality and beauty in her because she has to represent the women that were looking at her, beautiful women who thought that that their beauty was their curse in a sense, but they could use that beauty to get closer to God. That was a, a, a gift of God and nobody uh, could like um, forbidden these women from being forgiven and accepted into the church again. So regardless of your sins, Jesus welcomes you. That's the bottom line message. And beauty can serve a higher purpose. The last three examples, and then I will ask, I will give you some time for questions, comes from my favorite artist, of course, Caravaggio. Among the numerous examples, uh, I think Caravaggio's representations of uh, Mary Magdalene are the most powerful because it really transforms um, Mary Magdalene in an everyday woman, basically your neighbor in 17th century Rome. As far as we know, uh, Caravaggio created three different iconographies of Mary Magdalene, which remain the most original ones. And the first version belongs, the first two versions actually belong to his early period when he was still probably in the house of Cardinale Francesco Maria del Monte, who was his first patron and protector, the one that took him basically from the street and made him a superstar in painting and represent an episode that is never uh, shown in the gospel. Here, Magdalene now, she's identified with Mary of Bethany, and she's with her sister Martha. And as you can see, her sister Martha is trying to convince her. You see the gestures of the fingers? That's when somebody is trying to convince you in a painting. That was the kind of body language. She's trying to diver divert the gaze of her sister from being a sinful woman to become a follower of Jesus. And Mary Magdalene, I love her look. I mean, it's really a look of somebody who's thinking about something, like it's really changing inside already. With one hand, she's still holding uh, the symbol of her vanity and sinful life, which is the mirror. But with her right hand, she brings that uh, flower. It's an orange blossom, a symbol of marriage and love. And she brings it close to her heart inside, in as a like a as, as a sign that she's going to become the spouse of Christ. That's what she's going to embrace. And as you can see, the language of uh, Caravaggio is so, in my opinion, Caravaggio is so convincing because it brings us very close to this exchange of uh, gestures and expression. I almost feel like I'm sitting at the table with these two women and I'm participating in this conversion myself. But my favorite one is this one. Uh, another, it's they're all very different, these three iconographies, but they're also human because Caravaggio is really the one artist, in my opinion, despite the criticism that we receive, is the one that really took at heart the message of the Counter-Reformation to bring the people closer to Jesus' message. 
And what better way to do it than showing humble people, the same humble people that Jesus was talking to in his gospels and bring those people in the canvas and show to everybody that we are there. No, it's like a, look at that yourself, basically. This is an amazing portrayal because Mary Magdalene, I mean, we, her conversion is so human. She's like a sitting in this empty, dark, squalid room, like the rooms that Caravaggio always paint these figures in. And she's alone, completely alone. There's no angels comforting her. There's no divine intervention because the faith, it's a solitary act. The act of faith, you have to do it. You have to believe without seeing. That's what Jesus says in the gospels, no? So that's what she's doing. She's believing without seeing. She's abandoned, left alone. We almost like, a, do you see the perspective? It almost seems that she's portrayed by a person standing in front of her. Or maybe we are supposed to be having the role of Jesus looking down at her in a sense. And her conversion is not yet completed because she's still beautiful dress, but she has like got rid of all the signs of her uh, earthly life. The the jewelry is on the floor, is broken, and she's kind of like collapse. I don't know if she's sleeping or thinking, or she has cried so much that she has no energy anymore. But that's like the most human and most um, amazing representation of Mary Magdalene that I know. And the last one, the last one was painted by Caravaggio when he was running away from Rome. So very difficult moment in his life. Uh, he, uh, this time he was, um, he committed a murder. So he had to run away and escape. And um, and it's his painting changes a lot. And uh, in this case, Mary Magdalene is represented in a moment of rapture. As you can see, the head is tilted. The eyes are half open like the mouth and she's just like fainting and almost seems like I don't know if you have uh, in mind uh, Bernini later sculpture of Santa Teresa when she has this similar kind of like a uh, rapture spiritual rapture and it seems almost like a, a sensual also pose and situation and many criticize Bernini too for that to conclude Time to wrap it up. I did on purpose. I left out one important uh, document as uh, the last one because this document, unfortunately, did not influence art. This is uh, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. The Gospel of Mary Magdalene that was actually written around the second century but was not copied anymore after the fifth century and disappeared or was obliterated until it was rediscovered in the 19th century. The document is incomplete, has missing pages, but already uh, from those few pages, you can get a sense of um, a different kind of image of Mary Magdalene, and also a very different kind of message from the four canonical gospels. It's a very different kind of like type of writing. So I understand why probably the church did not want it to include it. Originally, the early church you know, wanted to include it in the canonic gospels. In this writing, Mary is represented as an early and important disciple of Christ and a leader in the early Christian movement. The gospel is very interesting because it opens in the middle of the discussion between the resurrected Jesus and his disciple. The Savior shares some important teaching. Salvation is achieved by discovering with the, within oneself the true spiritual nature and overcoming the bodily passion. The second message, he warns the disciples about not falling into the trap of setting new rules and, and laws and thinking too much about leadership. So basically he's telling them, don't think about rules, exactly what the church did afterwards, setting a lot of rules. And think about leadership, but we all have to share the same message together. And then he concludes by emphasizing something, a very important message in my opinion. To seek the child of true humanity within ourself and gain inward peace. Then after the, saying this message, he basically disappeared. He disappeared and everybody remains 
confused and in discomfort, except from Mary. She seems to be the only one who truly understands the message and start comforting the others. Then, at Peter's request, so she shares some teaching with them, some teaching that she only had received from Jesus through a vision. Very mystic, difficult messages about the soul ascension into the heaven. So after she tells the story about her visions, then something very interesting happened, in my opinion. Peter and his brother Andrew challenge her, moved evidently by jealousy. They say that her teaching is strange, and they question the fact that Jesus could have shared this advanced teaching to a woman, choosing her among all the others. Their limited understanding and false pride make it impossible for them to comprehend the truth, and they really like it, react like in a childish way and they attack her, and then she's defended by another of the apostles. And that's how the gospel ends. So uh, from this few excerpts that you can read yourself, uh, that I share with you, you can immediately sense that both the language and the content of this gospel is quite different from those of the canonic ones, as I said before. So I cannot stop sometimes by wondering, what would have happened if the church of the early years would have chosen the gospel of Mary as one of the canonic ones? That's the question I always ask myself. Would the church as an institution be different from what it looks today? Probably. What is certain, in my opinion, is that we would have had a different portrayal of Mary Magdalene than we see, to, we see today together. And a role uh, within the circle of Jesus, if properly recognized, would have paved the way for a more important role given to all women in general within the institution of the church. So the fact that this gospel was never included and her image was never taken into consideration leave us really wondering what would have happened. But, you know, the change can start now. Thank you. Thank you very much. This has been really very, very inspiring. And... Um, I, I think there's a, a few, I know we are on the time, on the hour, but uh, I know uh, Teresa and maybe uh, J John and others have some questions. I have many questions because uh, I love art, studied it with my mother who was an art expert in, in that period. And, um, but I, I open the, the line to everybody else here, or Elisa Tambien, uh, who's also an expert in the subject, who like to have any questions. We'll have maybe another 10 minutes for that. I don't know if anybody wants to, has a courage to ask something or? Uh, yeah. I have a, oh, sorry. Yes, go, 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 John. Go ahead. Um, I have a very, Quick technical question uh, with regard to Caravaggio's uh, depiction of Mary and Martha. Um, in the imagery that you described is the fact that um, Martha is referring to the, the left index finger. Do you have any information that you can provide on that fact? That she's, a, sorry, John, I did not hear you. She's it, Mary Martha. Mar yeah, Martha is referring to an index finger on her left hand in that painting. No, they do this, this gesture, let me see. When they do this, uh, is listing something. Uh -huh. And in every painting, you will see many paintings this. When people are trying to explain a fact or something, the most, the easiest body language that painters found to explain that is by making a list. So she's actually providing like a list of reasons why she will probably go away from her life from her sinful life and embrace, uh, you know, the the followers of Jesus, basically. Mm. And, and given the the esoteric nature of of not only the gospel of uh, Mary Magdalene, but Mary Magdalene's life and lesson, um, are there undercurrents with regard to the imagery that are depicted in actual painting, or should it be taken literally as a, a mode of expression that can be followed throughout many paintings? Do you are you asking me if the Gospel of Mary Magdalene influenced paintings? What I'm saying is the, the meaning of the painting. Um, are there esoteric understandings of hmm. the depictions? Hmm. I don't think so. I think that at that time, you know, no. And I'm telling you very convincingly because these paintings, you have to imagine at this time, 
artists also were not very well educated as we are today. They did mm -hmm. not have access to readings. And most of the times what they learned was through what their patrons told them to represent. So esoteric meanings in this kind of paintings, I don't think that there are. No. But in varieties, for sure, probably. Probably there are varieties that I don't know that discuss this. I mean, intellectual people where those people were writing, artists were not not yet considered intellectual, especially people like Caravaggio. Mm -hmm. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. you, John. Hey, Teresa, you have a question to close up the session? Well, um, it was pretty much like John. I do know that uh, many painters uh, use hidden symbols that, mm -hmm. uh, let's say, took the the history of Marie Magdalene according to a different kind of, uh, let's say, the, uh, ¿cómo se dice Evangelio? The, uh, the, um, the scriptures. The... No, the apocryph, the uh, pro prohibited uh, gospel. The gospels. Oh, oh yes, the gospels, yes. The, yes. the, the so, Mary Magdalene's gospels and all the other many gospels. Uh, yes, and since uh, these paintings happened during the Inquisition, they mm -hmm. had to respond to whatever the Catholic Church asked exactly. them exactly. to do. Exactly. So Otherwise, they, they, will be, they will be destroyed. Otherwise, they will be destroyed and the painters will, will have been killed. <laughs> exactly. Torture. Oh, for probably yes you know, i don't know torture for sure <laughs> torture for sure until they change their minds so many of them used to hit, hide or hit their symbol symbolism that represent a different story a symbolism mm -hmm. that i was uh um recognizing while you were sharing okay uh, those paintings. But if you see anything, let me know because I don't know. Uh, yes, yeah, so I would like to get together with you and Laura and and share that those hidden symbolism and you have the, the two, the the two versions. Reading. What? <laughs> you are the expert on the esoteric reading, you know, on the I I listened to your talk. Oh, so oh. I really, yes. Um a very well, esoteric, I don't know. But Gnostic for sure. Yeah, Gnostic. Sorry, I used the wrong term. You're right. Gnostic. Yes. So it would be great if we really? can share both mm -hmm. visions in the That's same right. in the same piece of art. And you yeah. could give me. Uh, I would be happy to try to figure it out if there are any writings at this time. I'm not an expert on that, honestly. I didn't have the time to dig on that. What kind of writings were circulating? what people were reading. I found mostly poems and um, operas about Mary Magdalene, but they were always commissioned within like yeah. um, the institutions of the church or people that were very faithful. Mm -hmm. So they all sound the same. Like this. Yeah. So right. No, it would be yeah. it would be great to have a webinar where you both uh, have compare and contrast literature, okay. art, and uh, the actual Gnostic uh, Gospels. But um, on this note, we will have to close this uh, webinar because uh, we are beyond the hour. And I'm sure there's a lot of questions, but we will uh, revisit this uh, topic again in the near future. On this note, I would like to thank you, Evelyn. Thank you very much. This was a really inspiring and beautiful uh, conversation and, and introduction on women and uh, Mary Magdalene art and uh, the impact and the, the non-written uh, method uh, messages that were in those um, paintings. And would like to mention that the next webinar will be on February the 23rd and our speaker is James Coates. He's a poet and passionate about the, the, the dissemination of the concept of redrafting the Nicaean scrolls. He believes that what was written in the Nicaean uh, um, a a councils was all a lie. And so for many years, he's been trying to uh, move forward this concept through the church. And he will share what he's done so far on that. 
and his uh, findings and uh, why. On that note, also I want to mention to you that uh, Teresa Gagne will be sharing um, the webinars, another five webinars in Spanish on Mary Magdalene before her life, during her life, during the Qatars, Templars, and current impact and legacy uh, in the next uh, five webinars. So I thank you all for participating and for joining this webinar, and we will see you in the next uh, webinars shortly. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.